Welcome back, everyone. My guest today is April Kung, a veterinarian and author who is more commonly known as Dr. K. Dr. K is working on an eight-part series of books called On Being a Veterinarian. The first three books in the series are available now. I loved book one of the On Being a Veterinarian series, What to Expect and How to Prepare. In it, Dr. K clearly addresses the emotional challenges of working with animals and with the people who love the animals. I invited her to join us on Unleashed at Work and Home today to talk about dedication, specifically how pursuing resilient skills requires the same kind of focus and dedication as academic achievement or a dog desperately trying to get the last bit of peanut butter out of a Kong. Welcome, Dr. K. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Colleen. I love your podcast. Thank you. Can you tell us what inspired you to write your book series? Well, um, it was my own personal experiences coming out of veterinary school and uh, finding that being a veterinarian was not exactly what I expected it to be and struggling for several years and finally telling myself, you know, I had to find a better way of being with this career than uh, the techniques that I was using. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Otherwise, I wasn't going to last. And uh, so I, I, I just started doing some research and came upon these things that I talk about in my book. And uh, I find that they work. They're, they are hard work, but they work. <laughs> well, and anyone who's gone all the way through vet school, which is, you know, seven to nine years of higher education, has done some hard work before. It's true. It's true. But you know what's really interesting about going through school, and, and regardless of whether it's an undergraduate degree or, you know, vet school, is you get a lot of external val validation mm -hmm. along the way. So you get these external rewards that keep you going. But then when you get into the real world, often that external validation is not there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have these expectations of what it's going to be. Oh, you know, people are going to be so grateful for all mm -hmm. the great things I'm going to do. And that's um, not the case as much as we think it's going to be. So. Right. I, I talked to one vet who said um, one of her challenges is, you know, she will just perform a miracle on an animal and, and the people are so, 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 so grateful. And they're like, you're amazing. And then they get the bill and they're like, oh, and she says, so that joy only lasts as long as it takes them to walk to the front desk. And she said, I feel terrible because I have to charge for my services. I, I need to make a living here. But right. it's so draining all the time because even when I think like, yes, this is a rousing success. Sometimes I'm not getting the feedback, like you said, the external feedback of, yay, you're fantastic and making that last. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a story just like that. I saved a cat's life. The wife brought in her dying cat and I saved the cat and I was so proud of myself. This was early in my career. And then the husband called up and chewed me out for how much the bill was. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. no, no, not much of a reward there. Yeah, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. In your book, you had a... a some some scary statistics, actually, I thought. Um, you, you mentioned that 38% of vets say they, only 38% of vets say they would definitely choose to be a vet again if given the chance to decide again. And yeah. that vets in their first five years of practice report the highest levels of psychological stress and job dissatisfaction. So I think mm -hmm. some of that is the disconnect between what we think it will be like and what it really is like. Mm -hmm. What are your Absolutely. thoughts on that? It's it's absolutely true. And and again it goes back to you know focus and persistence and dedication are much easier to sustain when you're getting constant feedback from the world saying good job. Hey, there's an A. You got an A on the test. You got an A on the exam. But then in the real world when it's not there, it's much more difficult to maintain that focus and persistence. And a lot of vets, I think, in the beginning, they're so overwhelmed with their new responsibilities that um, <clears throat> they, they, they just lose track of the vision that they had for what their career was going to be. And they find themselves in a completely different world than what they expected. Mm -hmm. So from the, from the perspective of dedication, what do you think are the benefits of dedication as a behavioral trait? Well, I think that so if you if you can sustain dedication without external validation, I think this is this is the quality of successful people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you get out into the real world and, and like I said before, not necessarily graduating vet school, but just starting to work in the workaday world 
where nobody's giving you an A Mm -hmm. (laughs) for for working hard. Um, The people who are able to sustain focus and persistence and dedication without anybody patting them on the back or telling them they're great every day, those are the people that tend to succeed. Right. Um, And those are, they're also the people who tend to be really good at delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard about the, I think it was called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Yes. (laughs) Back in the 70s. Yeah. Yes. So they, they they left a kid alone in a room with a marshmallow and said, if you can wait until I come back to eat this, I'll give you another marshmallow. And uh, some of them could wait. Some of them couldn't wait. But they followed up with those kids years later. And the ones who could wait uh, ended up being um, more successful mm-hmm. in, in general in life. Academic Have you seen the videos age. of that? Have you seen the no, videos have- of that? Oh, they're hysterical. They're, the children are trying everything. They're like covering <laughs> it or they're holding it close and smelling the marshmallow. One child is like licking it. Oh, that's <laughs> that, that doesn't count, does it? <laughs> but I, I'm sure I would have been one of the ones who grabbed the marshmallow. You know, like after a few minutes, you're just like, oh, I, I really want that external reward. It's hard to wait. And it, it is hard to wait. Grit is a big subject of uh, – study these days. And I think sometimes dedication and grit can be very, very similar. Um, I think Mm -hmm. dedication is an element of grit. But that whole piece of like moving toward a goal and keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, it's hard. It is hard. I think that people who are good at exercising delayed gratification, they are envisioning a a positive future for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the vision of that future is what's driving them. So you know, when they're thinking about it, that's kind of a reward that's spurring them on, right? But like in the case of somebody who's going into veterinary medicine, when you get there and the vision doesn't match the vision that you've been using to drive yourself forward all that time, um, it, it can be very disturbing and disorienting, yeah, um, disillusioning. So which comes back to, you know, the things that I, I included in in that book one, uh, what to expect and how to prepare. So resilience, I think building the skills uh, to be resilient is what's going to enable you to give yourself the rewards that you deserve when the external world isn't giving them to you. (laughs) That's very true because you do have to give yourself the rewards. And, And we sort of have this idea that any of that is selfish, you know, anything nice I would do for myself. I need to be hard on myself to make sure I keep moving forward. But some of, sometimes we need to be really compassionate to ourselves and really build those rewards in and find them for ourselves when, when the world isn't providing them. Absolutely. You mentioned in the book that you hiked along the Appalachian Trail. Did you do the full trail or... No, oh I did five five hundred miles. Only five hundred miles, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the Appalachian Trail seems like just absolute dedication kind of stuff. I, I have friends who've hiked it, and and I tease them. I'm like, why would anyone want to do that? Where is the external reward in it? And yet, everyone who hikes it seems to really love it. So, what were your experiences in that in terms of dedication? Like, did you have to push yourself to keep going, or was it motivating enough? As you went, or was it minute by minute? <laughs> it was a constant physical hardship, and I was by myself. It was just me and my dog, mm-hmm. so it was scary as well. Um, I had some nights where I, yeah, I just felt like I might be in the middle of a horror movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I was in, I was in transition during that time. I didn't know what I was going to do next. I had left a career in advertising, had no idea where I wanted to go after that. And uh, I just felt like, well, maybe being out in the woods by myself will give me a chance to think and and find myself again and find a new direction. So that's why I did it. And did it work? Is that where you found a new direction? It did work. You know, it worked, um, especially in that it gave me a lot more confidence. You know, when you're out in the woods by yourself as as a woman, Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to learn how to read a map and use a compass and build a fire. Um, That's a huge boost to your Mm self-confidence. And I think that's where I I never thought that I was smart enough before then to become a veterinarian. And I think that that's when I really realized, hey, you know, I am capable. I I can do whatever I want. And I I think that that was the beginning of deciding that I wanted to be be a veterinarian. That's awesome. 
That, I mean, because it's a really important thing, because that's one of the first questions people ask if you're considering becoming a veterinarian is, you know, oh, you must be really smart. And that pulls into that whole fixed mindset concept of either I am or I'm not. And putting yourself into that experience gave you this growth experience where you were like, I can figure things out. I've, I've got yeah. it. I can do this. <laughs> that self-efficacy because yeah. Monty sure yeah. wasn't going to start the fire for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, self-efficacy. Exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting. So from a dedication point of view, the, the benefits of dedication are that it keeps us going and keeps us moving forward. And we'll need to find our own rewards. I mean, that that is a piece of it. Can you, what are the downsides of dedication? Like what, what's bad about dedication? Yeah, dedication. Um, so if you're doing delayed gratification because of the vision that you have in your head, um, and you never give yourself the rewards that you deserve, then I think the downsides are burnout mm -hmm. and compassion fatigue and depression, you know, yeah. and, and worse. You know, there's a high rate of suicide in the veterinary medicine field. And I think these are people who they're not recognizing um, how great they really are, yeah. you know, because the world isn't showing them the, the, the appreciation that they really do deserve. Mm -hmm. uh, the world doesn't understand what they do, doesn't understand how hard it was to save their cat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they just never give themselves the rewards that the world withholds from them. And so they f end up feeling hopeless and worthless. I think that's the downside of dedication. Yeah. You had a you had a really beautiful part that I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I'm not paraphrasing. I'm, I cut out a middle piece just to shorten it for the podcast. But mm -hmm. I thought this was really nice in your book. You said, if you are a compassionate perfectionist, I can say unequivocally that you are the best person for this job. But unless you can learn to accept the imperfections of practice... Unless you can learn to be patient with your own shortcomings, unless you can learn to forgive yourself, unless you can learn from your mistakes without being emotionally crushed by the accumulating weight on your conscience, even though you may be the best person for the job, this isn't going to be the best job for you. And I thought that's really the piece there, is that some of the people who really are the best person for the job may not have the tools to stay in the job long term, to really thrive in the job. They can do the work, but the work eats away at them. It does. It does. And it, it, what you're bringing up is really interesting because there's dedication, um, which can exist without perfectionism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's perfectionism, which I don't think can exist without dedication. Right. <laughs> so... I think that a lot of people who end up getting into vet school and graduating with their DVM degrees are both dedicated and perfectionistic. And um, perfectionism is, is great when you're in veterinary school because um, it drives you to get A's and to learn the material. Um, but you're, you're learning material that you're going to be tested on from professors. And, you know, it's either A, B, C or D. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not how medicine works in the right. real world. It's A, B, C, D and E and maybe F and in some cases G2. But <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So perfectionism um, works really great for people in very controlled and structured environments. Um, but when you get into the real world, especially the real world of medicine, um, perfectionism is a huge liability. Yeah. And it's something that gets people into vet school and through vet school. And I think that that's the main reason why I, I wrote book one is because once you get out of vet school, you really, you really need to learn how to temper that perfectionism mm -hmm. or it's, it's going to burn you out. Have you been a perfectionist in your life? I mean, is that something that you've struggled with along the way? Oh yeah. All my life. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and it can't just like stop you in your tracks. <laughs> like, if it can't be and perfect, sometimes... I'm not going at all. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, sometimes don't you find yourself going throughout the day and like, I don't know, you just like look across the room. You're like, oh, that picture is off kilter. I need to go fix it right now. Mm. And then look at yourself like, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, another thing I saw in your book 
that I thought was interesting was in a June 2015 article in Veterinary Economics, Dr. Dean Scott wrote, When people enter the veterinary field, we are flat out not prepared for the mental stress of the job entails. When I was a teenager, some veterinarians gave soft warnings about the job, but what I have encountered was so much more than they hinted at. And what's interesting about that to me is I was the teenager who was going to be the vet. I was the dog crazy kid. And everyone said, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I'm going to be a vet. And it was a veterinarian who I probably caught on a really bad day because I was volunteering in his vet clinic. And he sat me down and gave me the most depressing conversation. And <laughs> and I, I left going, I'm never going to be a vet. And just to read that line about that there were some warnings, but I couldn't really understand what it really meant and mm -hmm. how common that must be for veterinary students is to have a rosy ideal of, you know, what practice actually is like and then not not fully seeing the emotional demands. I mean, this is someone's beloved pet, a member of their family, and of course with animals' short lives, mm -hmm. you're helping them through the entire lifespan multiple times, and it's so draining, whereas human doctors, at least our hope is that most of your patients are going to last longer. Uh, mm -hmm. Animal doctors, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the short lifespans of our dogs and cats, <laughs> yeah. it's something that continues to sadden me, you know, because I've had so many and uh, they've each been just very good friends uh, mm -hmm. of mine. And, you know, I miss them still. Yeah. And then as a vet, you're playing a role in the passing for family after family after family of their family members, which is a really valuable service and such mm -hmm. a gift, but so draining for the vet if she doesn't have yeah. the skills to, to, as you said, kind of reward herself, build herself back up or himself back up because right. it's a real difficult job. So what do you say to vets and other, you know, vet techs and other animal care professionals who say, I'm too busy. I don't have time for self-care. What do I say to them? Mm -hmm. Wow. If you, if you, I mean, I, I totally empathize with the idea that you're too busy and you don't have time for it because I was there myself. And that is a road that leads to a very unhappy place, mm -hmm. an unhappy and unfulfilled place. I think we're here once. We have one life on this planet and it is completely, we're lucky enough to live in a country where it is actually within our control to choose a positive or negative road for mm -hmm. our lives. And if you are not, I, I don't believe that it's true. It's not true that you can't find time. You can. Mm -hmm. You can. We all have the same amount of time. And some people find the time. So that excuse just doesn't fly with me. You're making a choice. Yeah. For whatever reason, you're making that choice, but it's the wrong choice. It is. It is. It's hard, though, when, when people, it's that whole oxygen mask theory. You know, you just feel like, I have to save all of them. And the short-term strategy of, like, I have to put my efforts elsewhere, and you become sort of martyred. You often see that where, where people are like, I can't take a break because they need me. And you think, oh, no, 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 you're driving toward the cliff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of martyrdom mm -hmm. in veterinary medicine, and I totally understand it. But, um, you know, I was, there was a, a vet that I was talking to on Facebook, and, and she was saying she had gotten to that point where she was completely depleted because she yeah. had not been taking care of herself. She'd been given every, every ounce of her energy and love away. Mm -hmm. She gave it all away, and she had nothing left. And she was suicidal. She was thinking, yeah. why am I here? I don't want to be here anymore. I should just end it. And I said to her, okay, well, you know, you want so much to do good. If you end your life, you will never do good again. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you stay and learn how to take care of yourself, you will continue to do good. And you need to, I think a lot of times we need to allow ourselves to be much smaller than, than what we want to be. Yeah. You know, we don't have to be the hero to the entire world. What's wrong with being small mm -hmm. and taking pride in like making the, the grocery cashier smile mm -hmm. or giving your dogs a single happy day? Why mm -hmm. is that not good enough? Yeah. So 
allowing ourselves to be smaller and realizing that we we cannot be all things to all people. We cannot be the world's hero. We can't and we never will. So just allow yourself to be small. You're just a speck on the planet, you know, and it's okay to take care of yourself. I love that way of looking at it because I, I do think, and particularly in American culture, there's a be all you can be mentality, but it's those little things that make up life. It is the smile at the grocery store person, and you've made that person's day better, and you've made your day better by that experience. And same with the dog. You gave your dog a really happy day. Odds are that felt pretty good to you, too. Mm -hmm. So in, as you mentioned in the book, a lot of the best strategies for dealing with stress, things like deep breathing and gratitude, meditation and exercise, they can come across sounding glib or trite to somebody who's kind yeah. of at the end of their rope. <laughs> yeah. So what... What kind of can help people shift that perspective? What what suggestions do you have for that? Well, I don't know if this will work for everybody, but this is what worked for me because all of those things did sound glib mm -hmm. and flippant to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> crystals and uh, incense, <laughs> great. But um, the research that I did to write this book was um, the material came out of scientific journals. Mm -hmm. And so it all comes down to, for me, what incentivized me to try these things in earnest was understanding why they work in terms of how the brain works. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what was really exciting to me. Like, oh, there is scientific evidence yes. for why this works. It's not floofy, hoo-hoo, fairy tale, fairy dust. Mm -hmm. You know, this is based on um, functional MRI studies. Yeah. And it's based on evolutionary theory. Why? Why do we tend to interpret things in a negative way? Mm -hmm. Because in the past, when we lived in the jungles and there were tigers and lions and things that wanted to eat us, focusing on the negative gave us a survival benefit. Yes. You know? And yeah. that part of our brain thinks we're still living there in the jungle, mm -hmm. even though we're not. So it really... Um, we have to use the more recently evolved part of our brain to tell the older, more reactive part of our brain, hey, it's okay. Mm -hmm. There's no lion. There's no tiger. It's right. okay. Let's have a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, building in that time between the stimulus and the response. But it is interesting how our, our brains are so wired for negativity. In fact, this weekend I was joking. I was out with some friends. And I had texted my husband earlier in the day, and I don't even remember what I texted him. It was just, oh, it was a photo. And he texted back several hours later. So my phone vibrates, and just on the home screen, it says mice with an exclamation point. And immediately, I'm like, oh, my gosh, there are mice in our house. And then another text pops up. Oops, I meant nice about the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, too late. My limbic system has been hijacked. <laughs> and he was like, what do you mean? I just, you know, like, why would you jump to the conclusion? I'm like, because 12 years ago, we had mice in the basement, like four. But it doesn't matter. My brain still thinks when I go in the basement, oh, I hope there aren't mice. <laughs> and, That's and a great example. <laughs> I was totally like, ah! There's mice in my and house. then you had a stress response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally. And it happens so fast before you, I mean, there's no like, oh, I'm going to get upset because apparently my house has mice. No. <laughs> right. I was totally right. and that, taken away. Exactly. Yep, yep. And that's how most of us are wired, you know? Mm -hmm. The smallest thing, like, you know, I don't, somebody cuts you off in traffic and yeah. bam, you're in the stress response. Yeah. You know, and your heart rate is elevated and your blood pressure goes up and you're thinking pissed off thoughts, mm -hmm. you know? So the practices in this book, actually, they do allow you to create a space between stimulus and response. And that is, that's where magic happens, yeah. you know? And I've seen people who are, who have a really big, space between stimulus and response. And I am in awe of them. Yeah. Those people are in total control of their lives, their emotions, their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're amazing. And I've always wondered, I always thought, oh, they must have been born that way. Yeah. I was born that way, you know, but and it's true. I think some people are born that way. But to those of us who are not lucky enough to be born that way, there are actually things we can do to train right. our brains to be less reactive. Yeah. Resilience is a skill set and a mindset that can be learned. And it, it can mm -hmm. be. 
Mm -hmm. Some of us may have a head start, but I think all of us can learn it. And it's an interesting thing because uh, those people, too, they were drawn to them. You know, almost everyone is drawn to people like that. And we think, wow, they're so amazing. And it's really just that they are sort of open and calm and relaxed and, and kind of accepting of you do what you need to do and, and I'll do what I need to do. And and that's not how the rest of us are. We're all running around going, ah, 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 you're in my way, move. <laughs> need to get things right. done. Yep. I heard of this quote and it's sort of a secondhand quote. So unfortunately, I don't know who said it, but it, a, allegedly it was a monk. Mm -hmm. But he said, um, the key to happiness is learning how to say yes to everything. Yeah. It doesn't mean we accept it or that we're not going to strive to change it. Mm -hmm. um, but to allow it to happen and to just to realize this is reality, this is what's happening. Um, and instead of just reacting against it, we can be calm and uh, accept it and then try to change it. Mm -hmm. I guess. But I, I like that. Say yes to everything. Yeah. In theory. And then in practice, it's <laughs> so uncomfortable that we have to learn well, to like it there, too, because of the negativity bias. <laughs> yeah, the negativity bias. But that brings us back to the subject, um, this, you know, really fascinating subject, subject that you wanted to discuss, which is dedication mm -hmm. and dedication to building the skills of resilience. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, exercising your body, too. Like, mm -hmm. does anybody really want to get on the treadmill? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't. You know, I do it every day. And every day I'm like, ugh. Right. But afterwards I feel wonderful. I feel glad that I did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, I think it's the same thing with these, with, with these exercises. It's taking care of our mind. So being dedicated to doing these things, um, despite the fact that there may not be an immediate reward, but I think if we can hold the vision of ourselves in the future as somebody who has that presence of mind, somebody who's going to be less reactive, and somebody who's going to be able to um, be happy even when the rest of the world isn't telling us that we're great. Yeah. If we can hold that vision in our mind, then perhaps we'll be able to muster the dedication that we need to learn to become good at these skills. Mm -hmm. It's the simple but not easy. But I think if we focus again on, on being smaller, you know, like focusing on doing what I can do and what can really make a difference in my life today and build out from there, I think that will really start to change things for lots of people i hope so i hope so, I hope so. I hope so <laughs> and you know what you said earlier about dr dean scott um and i actually interviewed him for my podcast mm -hmm. he's so wonderful <laughs> but um I, I want to make it clear that i am not trying to dissuade people from becoming veterinarians um people who become veterinarians are called to become veterinarians mm -hmm. And I don't think there really is any dissuading them. You yeah. know, 30 years ago, I think there were different reasons for becoming a veterinarian. People became a veterinarian because it was a good way to make a living. And it was a great way you could open your own practice and become, you know, very financially successful. But that's not why people are becoming veterinarians these days. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you can't talk them out of something that they're called to do, that they feel called to do. Right. I really, really, really want to help them be prepared for the reality of this career. Because once they step from veterinary school into practice, two things, one of two things are going to happen. They're going to get hit by a freight train and knocked over. And once you get knocked over, it's very difficult to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Or they're going to be emotionally and mentally prepared in advance for what it's really going to be like. And they're going to have the tools that they need to manage that early part of their career where they are going to be making mistakes, most of the mistakes, where they are not going to know everything, where translating what they've learned in vet school into actual clinical practice is going to be a huge challenge for the first several years. If they have the tools that they need to manage their emotions through that period, then at the end of, you know, the five years or whatever it takes until you feel like, oh, okay, I, I think I can do this. <laughs> I really then am a vet. <laughs> they're going to be in a really positive space. Mm -hmm. Which I think is is why your book series is eight parts. I mean, I think that whole idea of 
that it it is a multi-layered process of figuring out all of the tools that they need to really make it through. And um, I'm not going to read all eight because that will drive everyone crazy. But the idea of, you know, what to expect and how to prepare, really focusing on what to get out of vet school, recognizing some of the boundaries, you know, competence, caring and caring too much mm-hmm. and and being aware of the financial pieces. And I think some of those are pieces that people don't learn so much in vet school, like how to deal with the financial aspects of it and the emotional aspects of it seem extraneous to the how do I take care of this animal's body? Well, it's not relevant. How do I take care of my emotions while I take care of this animal's body? Or how do I take care of my finances while I take care of this animal's body? And yet, <laughs> and yet, um, yeah. all of these pieces are really going to make a difference in, in vet students being able to thrive. So I think that you're going to just make such a big difference with the work that you're doing. I, think I hope so. I mean, the way I see it, you know, once you get in and you get bowled over by that freight train, you're no longer in a position to come up with the solutions. Yeah. So my hope is that all of these kids that want to be veterinarians, um, to talk to them before they even get to vet school Mm -hmm. or while they're in vet school, because they're the future of veterinary medicine and they're going to come up with the solutions and the broader their perspectives, um, and the more better prepared they are emotionally and psychologically, the more likely they are going to be able to come up with the solutions that we need. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's wonderful. And I think that because this is slow practice, it takes some time to do it. If they can be learning these skills now as they go through school, they'll be that much further along by the time they start practicing that they will really be able to use it. Absolutely. So that one, is my hope. Yeah. One of my favorite questions to ask people in my podcast is if your dog could talk, how would he describe you? And you mentioned that you have three dogs, but your dog, who's a real character, is a mutt named Leonard. So how would Leonard describe you, Dr. K? Huh. Leonard. Leonard would say that I am the best thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> he was a sad dog when we got him from the shelter, and he is a very, very happy dog now. Awesome. That's perfect. So how can listeners reach you and find out more about your books and your work? Um, Probably the easiest thing to do is just get online and go to my website, which is www.realize.vet. Wonderful. And I will be sure to put a link in the show notes. Thank you. So we'll wrap up here and just tell everyone that, yes, working with animals is emotionally draining. It is. If you don't take care of yourself, you're likely to experience burnout or compassion fatigue, and nobody wants that to happen. So if you're ready to take some baby steps toward greater resilience, why not go to my website and download the free PDF, 10 Ways to Recharge When You Don't Have Time to Take a Break. It's at colleenpilar.com slash 10 tips. That's www.colleenpilar.com slash the number 10, T-I-P-S. Thanks so much, Dr. K. Oh, thank you. It was a lot of fun, Colleen.